Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. It's Jessica Ward King, the Stigma Crusher here. First of all, for those of you that have been asking, my wife is doing fine. She is resting. She is doing what she's supposed to be doing. She is recovering. I actually, incidentally, am also doing fairly fine. I ended up with a bit of a switch from depressed to manic and quickly caught it, got my sleep back in order, and I'm feeling quite all right. Um, so that's good news from our household. Today, I want to talk about a bit of a, a fun topic, I guess you might say. It's a bit of an odd topic, nonetheless. Um, how neurosyphilis changed the game for psychiatry. And you may be thinking to yourself, syphilis, like the sexually transmitted infection syphilis? Yep, that's the one. So syphilis has been around for as long as people have been around practically. And it turned into the form that it's in now where it's sexually trained. There, there are several forms of syphilis. I was looking into this earlier. There are different forms of the bacteria and there are four forms and only one of them is a sexually transmitted infection. And that seemed to start to get spread around Europe in the early 1300s, maybe a little bit before that. And it seemed like whatever country you were in, they blamed their opposing, the, the enemy country, for this outbreak of whatever it was. So they didn't know what it was. They just knew that it was some kind of a pox, you know, on the, on the population. And so the English said it was the French disease. The Germans said it was the Italian disease. The Italians said it, whatever the case was, wherever you were, you blamed it on the enemies. And it spread all over, um, it spread the, over the, the, the European continent, into the Asian continent, uh, down into the African continent. The only place it didn't seem to get was over into the Americas because the populations had already split off by then. But pretty much anywhere you went on the land mass that is like Eurasia and Africa, um, you would find neurosyphilis and you would find this, this sexually transmitted infection. And so there were a lot of theories about what caused it. Um, mostly, I mean, they, you know, they could tell that there was some relation to sexual infection. And so it was a dirty disease. It was portrayed in art and history as such. Um, and it was definitely highly stigmatized as a disease. It was like leprosy in that way. And it was often called leprosy, even though they, they did note that there were different characteristics, but it was kind of called the same thing um, with the limited understanding that the populations had of medicine. And of course, there were theories about being from the gods and, and from, you know, that you didn't give homage to the right king or the right whatever. <laughs> so there were all kinds of theories about this. But one thing that did happen when we started to have uh, psychiatric institutions, so hospitals, like a medical model or some kind of place to put all these people that were suffering from what seemed like the same thing, some kind of mental illness. For a while, they would put them in like almshouses or prisons if behavior was a problem. Um, and gradually there came and there came to be this movement to, to, to create these asylums. Um, and there are a couple of really infamous asylums where people were treated very horribly. Um, the people that were put in there were chained and, and not fed properly. And there was not a lot of good uh, nutrition or water cleanliness or, you know, they, and there, there were horrible restraints and all kinds of things. So um, Bethlehem is one of them. So the, 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 mayor, this, the hospital of Bethlehem in, uh, in London is one of those, those infamous cases, for example. Um, but when they started to put these, these, groups of people together, that's where people with what they call neurosyphilis would go. And the way, I mean, neurosyphilis is it, everybody that gets syphilis, it seems to attack the, um, the, the cerebrospinal fluid and the brain very early in the disease. It's in there. So if you take samples of cerebrospinal fluid of someone who is infected with syphilis, you will find it in there. But you can get symptoms of neurosyphilis or like a, a neurological symptoms of syphilis at any point in the disease. It often happened though, as the disease progressed that this would also progress with it. And so the first thing that would happen usually is swelling of the meninges. So you'd get like a meningitis reaction, headaches, sensitivity to light, vomiting, um, fever, that kind of thing. Um, and then the next thing that would happen would be this kind of general 
psychiatric decline. So there could be in the first stages, um, things like uh, movement disorders, depression, um, irritability, memory loss. And as it got worse, then you would have things like it could be suicidality, there could be hallucinations, delusions. It was once said that if you know the presentation of neurosyphilis, then you know all of psychiatry, because basically any symptom you can get in psychiatry can happen with neurosyphilis, literally everything, but mania, like the symptoms of bipolar, symptoms of, uh, of schizophrenia, symptoms of depression, of anxiety, every, every symptom you can see, you can also see with neurosyphilis. And so these people, it was called general paresis of the insane, um, that was the name of this, this illness. And it basically was applied to everyone that they couldn't figure out what their, their um, diagnosis should be. And they were locked away. And it wasn't until 1905 that uh, two physiologists, um, med medical men, they were kind of, they did everything at the time. They found that there was an actual bacterium that was, that caused syphilis. They found for the first time in psychiatric history, they found a cause for psychiatric symptoms. And the cause was a single bacterium and later when, once they figured out that penicillin was an antibiotic, penicillin very accurately treats this bacterium. And quite often, at, at least in the times before HIV, um, someone could be cured of syphilis with the administration of penicillin. And so there was a very sharp decline from the, like, the moment that penicillin was created uh, up until around the 1980s. There was a very sharp decline in the cases of syphilis. They were very accurately treated with penicillin and people could go on their merry way. Um, unfortunately, there has been an uptick in cases of syphilis and they're getting harder to treat. And that's because the human immunodeficiency virus, um, HIV, causes that the immune reaction to be different. So now um, drugs that used to work and bi bacteria that used to be eradicable um, are no longer treatable as easily or sometimes at all. And so the cases of syphilis have been on an uptick. Nonetheless, um, so that's the sad, the sad part of the story, obviously. But nonetheless, what neurosyphilis did for psychiatry was give it its first win. We had known for years that people with this general paresis of the insane, that when, when they did die, which the, eventually that is, that is the outcome of syphilis, when they did die and, and an autopsy was done, their brain looked different. So we know that syphilis causes specific changes in the brain, in the frontal lobes and in the occipital lobes, for example, but it, it really spares the motor cortex. Um, and so we've known that it actually looks different. The brain looks different, but they didn't know why. And so they thought, well, maybe the brains are different and that's what causes the disease or does the disease cause the brain to look different? They weren't sure. Um, and it wasn't until that bacterium was found. And of course, as soon as that bacterium was found and it was found to you know, you could take penicillin and cure this thing. And so these people who were going to be, they thought, insane for the rest of their lives. They were going to be in this asylum for the rest of their lives. They were seeing things, hearing things, manic, whatever. Take some penicillin for a couple of days and get up and walk out and, and go out into the world. They thought, wow, we solved it, right? And so why not give penicillin to everyone with mental illness? Unfortunately, of course, that didn't work because other mental illnesses are not caused by a bacterium, at least not one that we found yet and not one that can be um, solved with our modern antibiotics. So we found one cause and one cure. And then the hope was on that we would find more biological causes. And that's what the whole history of psychiatry is, is looking for the cause of the psychiatric disorders because once you find a cause you can start looking for a solution but until you have that cause until you have that biologic agent all you really have are lists of symptoms hung together so syndromes and we've talked about that on this channel before that psychiatric diagnoses right now 
they really are just syndromes. They are lists of symptoms that seem to hang together in certain populations. But there's so much comorbidity. So you're very likely to find in someone who has depression that they also have symptoms of anxiety. They may also have symptoms of an eating disorder or have symptoms of, uh, uh, of even psychosis, right? So you find that there's this comorbidity that a lot of the symptoms of one disorder are also symptoms of another disorder and they they hang together as as separate entities yes but there's also a lot of mushing together and the hope is if we could just find the causes and so with alzheimer's research for example now alzheimer's i mean there's some debate about whether that's a mental illness is that a neurological condition does it is there really a difference does it really matter but with alzheimer's disease when they found the misfolding proteins in the brain and the, the tau tangles in the brain everyone thought ah oh, we're gonna do it again we're gonna find a cause we're gonna find a biologic agent that's causative of an illness and we're going to be able to fix it or at least we're going to know for a while what caused it so that we can work on fixing it we can work on therapies for it but right now for the psychiatry has really not repeated that feat so neurosyphilis was the first and pretty much so far only time that psychiatry has found a biologic agent and it didn't even do it by itself it kind of did it by accident um so that's what neurosyphilis did for psychiatry. We are trying, we are hoping, we are praying and we are working hard to make it happen again, to find out what it is, whether it's a bacterium or a virus or uh, misfolding proteins or, uh, you know, a difference in brain architecture or whatever it is that causes another of our mental disorders so that with that cause, we can start to unravel a solution. And the more causes we can get, the more ways we can figure out that these illnesses are working, the better the chance that we can figure out something else. So as soon as they started finding twisted proteins in the brain for Alzheimer's, people were like, I wonder if other diseases have twisted somethings in the brain and started looking at those. And so all of these advances in research even though they seem really incremental, some of them, like like the neurosyphilis advance, are huge, monumental, huge steps for science. But a lot of science happens in little, tiny, incremental steps. And it's so painful to watch sometimes. And sometimes someone will go off on a tangent and it will mean nothing. And sometimes it'll seem to go backwards. But science is iterative like that. And so every time we find out any new piece of information, it's a potential key to figuring out the whole thing. So neurosyphilis gave us hope. Um, neurosyphilis gave us our first win. And I'm betting, not only hoping, but betting it won't be our last one. So that is all I wanted to reflect on this week. Um, I hope you found it as interesting as I did. Uh, definitely go and search into the history of neurosyphilis if you found this interesting. If you want to know more, let me know down below. And uh, take care of yourselves this week, and I will see you in my next one. Bye, guys. Stigma Crusher.